here from Abundant Life for Scythe Church. I want to say thank you for tuning in today uh, via Facebook, YouTube, whatever you may be doing to watch this service. I believe God has a word for you. I hope you'll watch the entire video today and may God touch you through it. But look, if you want more than just a video, you want a personal experience, you want to feel the presence of God, I want to invite you out to Abundant Life for Scythe, 962 Juliet Road. Look, we have a lot of stuff happening here. Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., we have my groups, which uh, covers a variety of age groups, women's ministry, men's ministry, all these things are happening. Also, Sunday mornings at 10.30 is when our worship service starts, followed by the preaching of the word. Then Tuesday nights at 6 p.m., we got prayer meeting. Wednesday nights, we got a, a Bible study slash preaching that happens at 7 p.m. with youth ministry, children's ministry once again. And now we also offer Celebrate Recovery at 7 p.m. on Thursday night. Look, there's a lot happening right here in Forsyth, Georgia, and I believe God gave you this video today to help you get connected. So I want to encourage you, I want to invite you to come out and be a part of what's happening. I personally want to meet you. If you'll come down here and you'll let me know that you watch this video, I have a special gift just for you. Hey, God bless you. I appreciate you watching this, and I hope to see you soon. Turn around, tell somebody you're glad to see them today. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. first time here raise your hand up right there right there the man right there in the middle and look the man right over there on the outside amen this ain't much but this is just a token to say we appreciate you coming out and worshiping with us you could have worshiped with anybody this morning you chose to be here and we don't take it for granted amen amen praise God hope forms good to see y'all here this morning ladies amen and and brothers and brothers amen well this morning uh we're gonna just preach a simple message it's mine did somebody say it's mine it's mine say it's mine and you ain't getting it amen amen sometimes you gotta take authority over some things in life this morning we're gonna be in the book of kings first kings 21 verse 1 and 3 uh, when you get there, you can stand for the reading of God's Word if you're physically able. Hallelujah. I'm excited about what God's fixing to do. Church, we are called to be victorious. And we have let the enemy come in and steal things from us. And the first thing he steals is he steals our joy. He steals our peace, our happiness. He steals our victory, the victory that God has already given us. And we just let him come in and take that from us. And it's time that the church says, no more, devil, it's mine. It's mine. Amen. How many of you there say amen? All right, it says, now it came about after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard so that I may have, a, have it for a vegetable garden because it is close beside my house and I'll give you a better vineyard in place of it if you prefer. I will give you what it is worth in money. But the moth said unto, the moth said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid me that I would give you the inheritance of my father. Let's pray. Precious Lamb of God, I thank you today, Lord, for this day. For this is the day that you have made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. 
Father, I don't look at the circumstances or the situations, but I look at the one who can make a way when we don't see a way. And Father, today I'm asking you to do what only you can do, Lord. Bring healing, bring restoration. God, I ask you today to bring salvation to those that need it, healing to those that need it, the baptism of the Holy Ghost to those that need it. I ask you today, Father, to fill this place with your anointing and with your glory. I ask you today, Father, to anoint my lips to preach and teach your word. Anoint the ears to hear it and the hearts to receive it. I pray today that not one word spoken would fall on the hard thistle ground, but it fall on the fertile soil. I pray today, God, that everything that would be spoken would be water to the seed that's already been planted and a great harvest would start to come forth. In the name of Jesus, that wonderful master, you set this atmosphere to what needs to be sent. I bind up the things of the enemy that would try to bring a hindrance or confusion to this house. And I loose the Holy Spirit to have liberty to flow as he would. For truly where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is liberty. It's in Jesus' name that I ask these things. If you would agree with that this morning, shout amen. Amen. Give the Lord one more hand clap. As you're being seated, look at somebody and say, it's mine. Now look at somebody else and tell them it's mine. You got to tell everybody so don't nobody get jealous. And the last thing you need to do is look down and say, it's mine. See, you just told the devil it's yours. Tell them again, say, it's mine and you can't have it. It's mine and you can't have it. Amen. It's about time that the church takes back what is rightfully theirs. Amen. Hallelujah. So you don't realize that when you decree and declare things into the atmosphere, you're setting this atmosphere for God to move in it. When you sit there and you say, devil, it's mine and you can't have it, you're trusting in the Lord and uh, the Holy Spirit is able to move in this. He sets the atmosphere. But in order to get victory in some things, we got to let the little things just kind of fall to the wayside. The church is more worried about brothers and sisters in the church than they are about the world outside the church. We won't get mad at everybody in the church, and we don't get mad at nobody outside the church. Uh, we just let everybody do what they want to do, but we let somebody step out of line in the church, and we got to, oh, Jesus. Hmm. In order to get victory, we can't get hung up on the little things in life. We can't get hung up on the small things when God has something so much bigger and better in store for you and me today. Beloved, we are only scratching the surface of what God has for us. And so this morning, that's why I'm trying to get you to decree and declare some things uh, over, over your life and in this atmosphere. It's time that we become passionate about the things of God. Instead of just being complacent about it. Mm. You have to let the devil know that you're still in love with God. He told the church that you forgot your first love. Beloved, the church has forgotten the first love. And we've got to get back to the first love. Amen. Amen. We give our lives to the Lord, and we love him. We, we tell everybody about Jesus for about three weeks. And then we just kind of get into a complacent state. We kind of forget who he is until we need something. And then we won't be in love with him again. Uh, come on, you ain't going to help me this morning. It's okay. I, I preach anyway. I preach anyway. I preach to the wall. I don't preach to just a camera and six people in here. I can preach to anything. It don't matter to me. Amen. I once stood on a rock on the side of Highway 11 and preached the Word of God. Let me tell you something. I'll preach anywhere. It don't matter to me. If God tells me to preach, I'll preach. Because let me tell you something. It's my voice. It ain't the devil's voice. He ain't going to steal my voice. He done tried to steal my voice, and he can't take it out. Amen. 
So we spoke some things this morning, and you don't realize you done spoke that thing three times, and the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three, let a thing be established. We done established something this morning that said, devil, it's mine. It ain't yours. You can't have it. What God's promised me is mine. It's my inheritance. Mm. So Naboth had a vineyard. We would say he had a garden. Amen. I don't have a vineyard. I have a garden. I really don't have a garden right now, so I'm not lying. I'm just saying that I would have a garden. But to Naboth, it wasn't just any old garden. This wasn't any old garden. He just tilled the ground back there and called it a garden. Now, this garden had been passed down from generation to generation. This was his inheritance. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever had something passed down, it means a little bit more to you. Amen. And oftentimes, the things are passed down to have a little bit more value to them. And when something has a little bit more value to it, everybody else wants what you have. And that's what happened right here. Old King Ahab, he looked out there and he said, man, I, I like that garden. I want his garden. Now, Ahab, we got to understand, was one of the most evilest kings there was. He was married to Jezebel. And that didn't help matters. Because she was more evil than he was. And it wasn't out long after that he sees it that he says, i got to figure out some way to get that man's garden. Hmm. So after he rehearsed a plan, he takes a little trip over to Naboth's house. Now, we got to understand something right here. This is the same way the enemy comes into your life. He don't always just come rushing in. No, 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 no. Sometimes he's watching you, and he's saying, how can I get in and get what God has given them? Mm. He devises a plan of attack. So he offers Naboth a pretty fair deal on the outside. He says, Naboth, I'll give you a better garden than the one you already have. And if you don't want to do that, I'll give you what you think it's worth. Now, just think about that for a minute. We always say the grass is greener on the other side, don't we? But to give you a garden better than the one you already have, why would I even do that? That'd be like me saying, look, I'll give you $50 for your $100 because that 50 is better than that 100 It's ridiculous to even think that. And so the grass is always green on the side, ain't always true. But the fall for the trick that Naboth is trying to put wouldn't even make sense. Think about it. Would you give up something better than what somebody else has? Especially when you ain't even tested it. So Naboth, without even thinking about it, he says, it ain't for sale. Now, I ain't, I ain't adding or taking away from the scripture. You, you know what I'm saying here. But he said it ain't for sale. He didn't give it not one thought. He didn't take one minute to hesitate on it. He didn't entertain the idea. See, this is our problem. We entertain the ideas of the enemy. He didn't contemplate it or bounce the idea around off the walls. He didn't consult the stars, the horoscope, the palm readers, or the tarot cards. He simply said it ain't for sale. And the moth had already made up his mind. And you got to make up your mind, beloved, this morning that it ain't for sale, devil. I don't care what you offer me. It's my inheritance. And it ain't for sale. It may always look good on the outside, but it don't always mean that it is. Let me remind you something today, child of God. You have an inheritance. Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and have children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We are heirs of God. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 5 and 6. He said, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Unis or Enos or however you want to say it, I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. Paul basically said, Timmy, my boy, there's something inside of you. It's been inherited. It's been passed down. Your grandmama had it. Your mama had it. And now you got it. But I want you to remember something this morning. And you need to listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. Just because you got it now don't mean you won't lose it later. 
That's what's happened with the church. The God gives us something, and we don't, we don't, uh, we don't keep walking in it. We don't keep pursuing it, and we lose it down the road. There's gonna be some times when you're gonna have to stir it back up inside of you and say, "No, no, 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 no. I'm tired of living the dead life. It's time for me to stir up the gift. It's time to stir up the inheritance that God has given me." Mm. Look at your neighbor and say, "Stir it up." The devil is after your inheritance this morning. He's after everything that God has given you. And we have to make our mind up that we're not going to give it up. We're just going to stir it up a little bit more. I like to make the devil mad. Don't you? I like to make him mad. When he tries to attack me and I just act like it don't bother me, he gets mad. I know he does. I know he does because he fights even harder. But in the off basis, he said, you ain't getting it. It's mine. I want to look at somebody else for just a moment. Think about Ruth. Ruth uh, was Boaz's inheritance, so to speak. When Boaz was given the opportunity to take Ruth to be his wife, the Bible says in order to confirm his purchase or his inheritance, he had to take his shoe off. He had to take his shoe off and give it to his neighbor. That don't even make any sense, does it? We look at this and say, what does taking the shoe off have to do with anything? Well, you got to understand, not everybody had shoes in. Shoes was a, a very important and valuable commodity in their life. You know, you just couldn't go down to Walmart and grab you a pair of shoes. And Boaz didn't care what he had to give up in order to claim his inheritance. He said, I give anything. And he ripped his shoe off as quick as he could. Could it be that the same type of transaction happened when we read in the Bible outside the walls of Jericho between Joshua and God? Uh, Joshua in chapter 5, the Bible says that an angel came to Joshua and said, Take off your shoes for you're standing on holy ground. Watch this now. Perhaps what was happening was God was saying, Joshua, I want to give you the very ground that you stand on. This is your inheritance. I'm going to give it to you. But you got to give me your shoes to prove that you want what I have for you. So Joshua, this is what he's been praying, and he, he takes his sandals off it's as fast as he can. He had an attitude, God, if you'll give me what you promised me, then I'll give you the shoes off of my feet because I trust in you to guide and lead me everywhere that I go. Whatever it takes to get what mine, God, that's what I'm going to do. See, I want the garden. Gardens are full of growth. Gardens are full of life. Gardens produce harvest. And so I say to you this morning, if you don't have these three things in your garden, you don't have a garden at all. you got a graveyard. Your garden should be producing growth, life, and a harvest. That's what gardens are produced for. I don't plant a garden to say I hope every seed dies and don't produce nothing. No. Remember, it all began in the garden. In the Garden of Eden, God spoke man into existence. God gave man everything he needed inside the garden. But man messed it up. I said man, women, I ain't going to do that on you today. Amen. But even after she, I mean, he, he messed it up. God already began to give us a second chance. And the second chance would also take place in the garden. But this time it wasn't the Garden of Eden, it was the Garden of Gethsemane. In the beginning it was the Garden of Eden, that was the beginning of a flesh life. But in, in the end it was in the beginning of uh, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, it was the beginning of eternal life. It was in the garden that Jesus prayed, not my will but thy will be done. It was there that the final decision was made and Jesus said, I'm going to really do this thing. I'm going to bring my people salvation. It was then that eternal life was born for you and I. And what was birthed in that garden on that fatal night now belongs to all that have received Christ Jesus as their Savior. Somebody needs to give God praise for what Jesus did for you and I. He did it for you and I. But the moment you said, Lord, I make you my Savior, at that moment the enemy said, I'm going to steal everything God's going to give you. 
He wants to take the garden experience out of your life. You have to understand that the garden of Gethsemane was the place where Jesus would go to to pray. He would retreat there. The garden was his prayer closet. Now, you might have a prayer closet in your house. When the pressures of life seem to come and you just have to get away for a minute and you, you have to go to your prayer closet. Your prayer closet may be an actual closet. Your prayer time might be beside your bed. It might be the altar at the church. It might be a room at the church. But every one of us have a garden that we need to run to in times of trouble. Why? Because it was in the garden that Jesus went alone. Why did he go alone? So he could hear the Father speak to him. The problem is we don't want to get off alone by ourselves anymore. Therefore, we can't hear what God's trying to say to us. Sometimes we need to get off by ourselves. I'm asking you this morning, is there a garden in your house? Because it's in the garden that seeds of prayer are planted. It's in the garden that things are birthed out of you. It's in the the garden that the prayers are heard it's in the garden that victories are won it's part of your inheritance to have a garden that you can go to and pray to the father it's your inheritance but the devil wants to steal it from you somebody just say it ain't yours it's mine we're not going to give it up any longer devil we just going to start stirring some things up I don't know about you, but I used to run with people back in the day, and they always tried to stir up things. Hey, me, always trying to stir up things. Then they give their life to the Lord, and they're the weakest people they are, it seems like. I'm like, stir up something for Jesus now. <laughs> stir up something for Jesus. Hey, Amen. Walk down to the bar and just walk in there with your Bible and start preaching the Word of God. Stir it up a little bit inside there. You walk in the bar back in the day and stir it up with anybody in there. Go on in there and preach Jesus to them. So Naboth's garden was located in the valley of Jezreel. And Jezreel was a, a well-known place. There was a fountain that was in this valley. And this fountain was, uh, was uh, uh, powered by two streams that come together right there. And the Bible, uh, uh, the dictionary Bible says that the, the water there was excellent. It was perfect for uh, drinking water. It was uh, perfect for, for life. And uh, this pool also had a fountain there. Full of fish. So somewhere in the boss garden, uh, there was this wonderful fountain displayed. Maybe that's why he didn't want to give it up. Maybe it was the fountain. Maybe it was because he had all the water he needed. He didn't have to go anywhere. All the fruit and crops uh, uh, were, were supplied by this fountain of water. Uh, the fish that he wanted to eat, everything was right there. It made me enough, and I want to get rid of my garden. I like to fish. But his garden was inherited. It's easy to give up things that are not inherited. But it's difficult to give up things that we inherit. And I want to remind you today that you inherit everything. Everything that God has given his children. Don't give it up so easily. Don't let them steal your joy. Don't let them steal your peace. Don't let them steal your happiness. Don't let them steal your relationships. Don't let them steal your job. Don't let them do these things, beloved. It's yours. Jesus said that if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believed on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It's time that we get thirsty for the things of God that he's given us once again. We're thirsty for a move of the power of God like we've never seen before. We need to get even thirstier for it. If you're not thirsty, then somehow you need to develop a thirst. Jump on the bandwagon with the rest of us. We need to be like we were when we were kids. When you hear the old ice cream truck come. Oh, my God. Son, I didn't wait to hear the ice cream truck come. Run down there. I don't care if I was in the shower. I don't, I'm going to run down to the ice cream truck. But we won't run after Jesus like that. We had to beg people to come to church. Oh, Jesus. Maybe Jesus needs to ring a little bell like the ice cream truck and everybody come running. But he said he had to leave us so he could send a comforter. Let's chase Jesus for the Holy Ghost. 
Let's chase Jesus for the power and the authority that he said was ours anyway. Let's take our inheritance that he got. Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come, and I give you something to drink. The first thing we got to do is go where the fountain is at, beloved. Mm. Ah, I know you've been looking for it. Some of you have been seeking it. You can't find it. But I'm telling you today, get out of that old, dry, dusty ground church and find the fountain that's flowing. Find the stream that's flowing in the middle of a church service and come down and get some of the water of life. It's time for you to break out a spiritual shovel, beloved, and dig until you make your own fountain. The Bible says, seek and you shall find. God is waiting for somebody to put their foot on that shovel this morning. Dig a little deeper. And the deeper you dig, the bigger the flood will come. Mm-mm-mm. Is there anybody who's willing to break fallow ground this morning? Come on, somebody. Is there anybody that's going to dig a little deeper today? Is there anybody going to dig till they find what God really wants to give you? See, some of you don't know what God wants to give you because you refuse to dig. You refuse to put the labor in. Mm-mm-mm. No, I can't say it again. I was too rough last week. We need God's power and his presence like never before. So just because you're in the valley... Don't think it's a bad place. Jezreel was a valley. And most of the time when we're in the valley, we don't like it. We don't want to be in the valley. We always want to be on the mountaintop, don't we? But look at what happens in the valley. The valley was the place where Israel won uh, most of their important battles was in the valley. It was in the valley where Saul was defeated. And I know it don't sound like victory, but look at it from Israel's point. They got, uh, they got rid of a, a leader, not a king, but a leader, and they gained a great king, David, there. But God, see, had something better in the valley. You might be in the valley this morning, and you don't like it, but no, God's got something better for you in the middle of that valley because on the other side of the valley, there's only one thing, and that's up to the mountaintop. But you got to go through the valley to get to the mountaintop. Saul's problem was he chose his position for his own gain. He didn't no longer care what God wanted. He was consumed with his own agenda, beloved. And because of that, he died in the valley. We got to understand, we got to start focusing on what God wants us to do right now and not what we want to do. This ain't the time to say it's all about me. It's time to say, God, what you need from me. The valley is no place for people that are consumed with themselves. In the valley, there's a death that takes place. You have to die to yourself in the valley so you can come out for the glory of God. Because those who have given themselves to God don't find death in the valley. They find victory in the valley. But if you go in with the wrong mindset, you die in the valley. But I'm telling you this morning, there's victory on the other side of the valley. You just got to walk through the valley. Mm -mm -mm. Jesus. The valley of Jezreel uh, is where Gideon won the battle against the Midianites with only 300 men to fight an entire army. But Gideon and his men made up their minds. It ain't yours. It's mine, and you ain't going to get it today. And God took an impossible situation in the middle of a valley and brought a great victory. Beloved, he wants to bring victory for you. It's in the valley where the greatest battles are fought. It's in those same valleys where the greatest victories are won. And it's in the valley where we have no choice but to give it to God. Uh, when we give it to God, God produces. Mm. David knew all about the valleys. In Psalm 91, 5 and 7, he said, I will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence stalks in the dark or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not approach me. You may be in the valley this morning, but you're not going to find death in that valley. You're going to find the greatest victory that you've ever experienced, and you're going to find it right there in the valley. Some of you are standing in the valley for a long 
long time. And I believe today is the day that you'll walk out victorious over the battle you've been fighting in the valley. You just got to give it over to the Lord. And no other time for us to be in the valley fighting for the Lord right now than it is now. Joel prophesied to us, and I believe he was talking to us today. In Joel chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, he said, Put in a sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. There's no greater day than today, beloved. Here we stand with a decision to make. Are we going to give up on the things of God? Are we going to give up on the inheritances of God? Or are we going to stir it up? There's a revival that is ready to take place in this nation. I believe part of that revival is going to take place in October up there at Locust Grove campus. I believe there's a battle that's going to be won for this nation in that revival. I just got to know how many want revival. Revival has to start in you, beloved. It can't start in a place. You need to right now start praying for revival inside of you so that when you get there, mm, unity comes into that house and we see what takes place. It's time for us to use that old saying over my dead body. No, whatever it takes, Lord. Whatever it takes to win souls. Hey, I know it sounds bold and arrogant, but let me tell you, that's the attitude the Christian people need today. We need to get a little boldness. I think that's what the Bible said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Look, this thing is worth fighting for, beloved. It's worth fighting for. Can I have just a few more minutes? Let's look at Elijah for just a second. One man challenged 450 false prophets of Baal. Now that's pretty substantial odds. Elijah was a bad man. Amen. He had a bad God though, didn't he? He's a good God, but he's a bad God. You know what I'm saying? I don't like odds like that. But one man and God are always the majority. One man filled with the Spirit of God can rid our society of paganism and start a Holy Ghost revival throughout Forsyth right now, throughout Monroe County. Uh, I just need somebody to rise up and be a cut above the normal. Elijah was a cut above the normal. He never graduated from a college. He didn't wear fine clothes. He was a rugged man, a man of the country, the Bible says. He was a man with thunder in his voice and a tempest in his brow. Let me tell you something, beloved. It's time for us not to worry about how good we look. And let's go to battle. I don't think not one soldier stood in the mirror before they go to battle and say, Well, I look good today. Let's go win this one. They said, Give me a gun, give me a shield, a sword, or whatever, and let me go out there and take back what the enemy's trying to come and steal. See, Elijah approached on the scene of history at a time when Israel needed a prophet. We need a prophet in this land today, beloved. Jezebel had set up golden calves in the north and south. You got to understand, Baal worship was everywhere. Sex orgies, children, children were being sacrificed in the fire. Everything for Baal, nothing for the Lord because the, the altar of Jehovah had been broken down. Israel was returning to paganism. Man, don't we not see it today? Jezebel had 450 of her prophets who sat at her table. Now, they promoted, you got to understand, the doctrines of the devil. That was their goal. And let me just say this for a moment. Be leery of who you listen to. Because there are preachers today who are sitting at Jezebel's table. They're promoting doctrines of the devil. See, materialism uh, can be found at Jezebel's table. Gossip can be found at Jezebel's table. Jealousy can be found at her table. Formality can be found at her table. So why do preachers of today, Joy, sitting at the table of Jezebel, they're sitting there gossiping table, I mean conference tables. Uh, they're sitting there at tables of the, uh, the dinner table. you got to understand what these pastors and preachers are doing. They're trying to get the Biggest congregations at all costs, they don't care about the Word of God anymore. 
just what can I do to get you in the door? Mm. They sit at the ballroom, I mean the fellowship tables. But God's calling for an Elijah to rise up. God's calling for a true prophet of God to rise up among the people. I came this morning to say, man of God, woman of God, it's time to rise up and take back what's yours. And if you got to get a little bold and you got to get a little forceful with it, it's okay. You can take it by force. The Word of God tells me that I can. So it's time for us to do it. There's too many organizations out there today that are non-profit organizations, but we need an organization that is unafraid of what the government says, unafraid of what Congress says, unafraid of what the mayor or the police or anybody else says. We need a people today that is not bound by financial situations. Oh, I can't preach the word. I might offend the biggest tither in the church. Where are the Elijahs today to say no matter what? I'll serve my God. Whether I had to face 450 or 4,000, I'm going to serve the Lord. How long shall we be between two opinions? If God is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then follow him. Get off the fence. If Satan is God, then follow him. Build an altar to your God and let that God that answers by fire be God of your life. All day long, them old prophets are out there screaming for Baal to send a fire, send a fire, send a fire. They jump up and down. They jump on the altar. They take out their knives and start cutting themselves. Mm. Remember this. False worship will always leave you cut, bruised, and broken. Always. False worship will always leave you exhausted and empty-handed. False worship will never satisfy your soul no matter how much you pray. Because it's false worship to a false God. That's why so many people do so many things trying to fill the void. Because they're worshiping something that's not real. But at the time of the evening sacrifice, oh, Elijah steps up. Now, I can't just imagine Elijah if he had an S on his chest or something. He'd just come sporting that thing. Like, watch God. He starts rebuilding that altar, and he sits there, and he says, you know what? I'm going to do it by myself. The problem today is God has given us a church, and the altar has been broken, and we can't get not one to come aboard and build the altar back. This is the root cause of our problem, beloved. We have left the altar of God. The Bible sits around on most people's houses on a coffee table, open, and you can't open no other pages because they stuck together because they ain't never been opened. They sitting on the dash, getting the sunlight, looking like they've been worn out, but it's only been worn out from the sunlight. Ah. Uh, if we're going to have revival, we got to rebuild the altar of God. We must rebuild it in our homes, in our schools, and in our churches, beloved. Uh, in the government, the church sits by and lets one Jezebel take prayer out of school. We let one Jezebel legalize same-sex marriages. We let one Jezebel children decide if they want to be a boy or a girl. One Jezebel challenges the prophets of God. She's got 450 running around then. She's got more than that running around today. And nobody seems to care. And she's taking our inheritance from us. And it's time to say, it's mine. It's time to pray in your home. It's time to pray in your church. It's time to pray in the school, in City Hall, to pray on the square. It's time to pray everywhere that we can. It's time to let this spirit that is running around rampant, taking control, say enough is enough. It's mine, and you ain't getting what God has given me. It's mine. 
bedtime prayers now I lay me down to sleep I pray the Lord my soul to keep I ain't gonna do it in this day and time we need prayers that will move mountains and stir the devil and shake the foundations of hell as the word was given this morning 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. if my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways humble themselves pray seek the face of the Lord then he will heal the land it's time for us to pray beloved it's time to quit sitting around letting somebody else do it for us mm, show up for a prayer meeting see what it's all about let the Lord touch you in it come on up Pastor Jennifer we don't need broken altars beloved but we need broken vessels our hearts need to be broken for the Lord Matthew 21 44 says and whoever falls on this stone will be broken but on whoever it falls it will grind him to powder those who humble their hearts before the Lord will find salvation, but those who, whom the stone falls will ground into powder. Christ, as Elder Jim was talking about Wednesday night, the stone of Israel will fall on all nations, grind them to dust. I don't want to be a broken altar for the Lord. I want to be a broken vessel. It was the time of the evening sacrifice when Elijah stepped forth to rebuild the altar, it's time for our generation. The sun is setting, beloved. When are we going to rise up and be the Elijah? The prophets of God need to rise up because Jezebel is moving. It's time for the men and women of God to say watch out Jezebel watch out paganism it's my marriage and you ain't getting it these are my children and you can't have them it's my finances and I won't let you steal them it's my praise it's my worship it's my healing it's my miracle it's my joy it's my peace and you ain't getting none of it it's mine when Elijah repaired the altar, he laid his sacrifice, poured the water, prayed a prayer, then fire fell. You got to understand what this is representing for us today. The altar speaks of repentance. The sacrifice speaks of our heart before God. The water speaks of baptism. The prayer speaks of dependence upon God. And the fire speaks of the Holy Ghost. The fire burnt the sacrifice and licked up the water around it. Not one drop was left. And when this happened, people fell on their faces and cried, The Lord, He is God. He is God. God will pour out His Spirit today if we'll repair the broken altars that are in our life. Elijah had to repair the altar before the fire of God fell. If we're going to see revival, we have to repair the altar. The devil will be defeated when prayer is brought back. This nation will be blessed when men and women repent and pray. Right now, America is on a collision course with hell. The bloodhounds of hell have been released. And David said in Psalms 141:2, Let my prayer be set before you as an incense, the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. Stand with me today and lift your hands to the Lord. It's time for the evening sacrifice. It's time that we rend our hearts and not our garments any longer, beloved. Repair the altar. Be broken before the Lord. Some of us ain't, haven't visited an altar in 30 years. Oh, well, the altar is just a place for sinners. I beg to differ. The altar is the place that the fire of God will fall on your life. If you're trying to figure out why everything is dead and dry, it's because you refuse to go to the altar. It's the altar where you're going to have an encounter with God. It's the altar that you'll step into His presence. It's the altar that you'll be set afire again. 
on fire for the Lord. This morning as your hands are lifted, if you're in this place this morning and you say, Pastor, I've never experienced what you're talking about. Maybe it's because you don't know the Lord. Maybe you've walked away from the Lord. But today, if you're in this place and you say, Pastor, I need that fire back. I need to be rekindled. I need to rededicate my life. If that's you this morning, right where you're standing, lift your hand as high as you can. As high as you can, beloved. There's nothing to be ashamed of in this place. It's time that we repent. Let me tell you, this ain't a trick question. Everybody needs to have the hand up. All of us need to repent. All of us need to repent. Look, we haven't done what God's fully called us to do. If we had, we wouldn't be in the position that we're in today. This nation wouldn't be like it is today if we would just repent. Today. Let today be the day of salvation. Pastor Jennifer, if you would lead us this morning, she's going to lead us for a moment. Today, if you say, Pastor, I need that fire. I need the fire of God to fall on my life. I want you to come down to this altar and have a moment with them. We're not going to come in and mess with you. We, I want you to get along with God for just a minute. And then as the Lord wills, we may pray. But, but look, then we're going to go back. We're going to take communion today. We're going to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But beloved, today it's time to get back to the place. Most of us in here found our first love at the altar. But yet we never want to go visit his house again. When I fell in love with my wife, I didn't say, well, I ain't got to go over there no more. I was there every time her daddy let me come over there. Why? Because I that's what my love was at. Nothing should keep us from the love of God. Nothing should keep us from the love that the Father has for us. Beloved, it's up to you today to find that love again. Rekindle it. Master, today, I pray that the words I spoke were the words from heaven and not the words of man. I pray today, Father, that the words that I was, was speaking, God, were not words of condemnation, but the words of conviction by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm asking you today, Lord, that those that are willing, those that are, are willing to, to sacrifice, those that are willing to take to take this step this morning, God, those that, that, are, that know they need you, Lord, those that know that the dry places are inside, Lord, those that know that they've been living in a graveyard, Father, I pray today, Lord, that they would take that step. Father, as they step out, pour the fire of God on them. I ask you today, in the name of Jesus. Pastor Jennifer, if you would. Hallelujah.
All right, hey, Pastor Harold here again, uh, coming to you live. I want to say thank you for watching that message. I pray and believe that it has changed your life for Jesus Christ. And so today, if you made a commitment to serve the Lord, maybe for the first time, or maybe you was rededicating your life to the Lord, we want to know about it right here at Abundant Life for Sight. You can hit us up on our Facebook page by Messenger and just simply type, let us know that you uh, made that decision today because we want to get in contact with you and let you know what your next step is as a child of God. We also want to encourage you to find a church home. We believe your church home is right here. God has led you to watch uh, our sermon today, our messages, and we believe that he has drawn you to this house. And so we would like to hear from you. We'd like to see you here at our services at one of uh, Sundays, 9 or 11 a.m. We also have Wednesday night service at 7 p.m. with complete youth ministry, children's ministry, the whole nine yards. Hey, we want to see and hear from you. Also, I want to just simply touch base. A lot of people ask us how they can sow into this ministry. Well, there's several ways that you can do it. Number one, you can mail it to 962 Juliet Road, Forsyth, Georgia, 31029. You can also download our app. Our app is called Abundant Life Church Georgia. You can find that either in iTunes or on Google Play. It's a free app. Download it. You can go on there and click on the Forsyth campus, give to Forsyth. You can give that way. You can also give through our online website. Now, that I'll have to get you a little bit more information on. But if you would like to send a prayer request, you can also send a prayer request uh, through email to ForsythInfo at AbundantLifeChurch.com. The last thing, you can always contact us by phone, and we can give you any information you need. Our phone number is uh, 470-369-7300. Hey, I pray and believe that God has touched you today, and I want to hear from you. Hey, stay tuned. we got a lot of messages coming your way. God bless you, and have a great day.